Snell's Law. All right. So, a little bit of history. Our earliest known person to have discovered the law was actually a Persian scientist. Named Ibn Saul. There are records of him using this law as far back as 984. Now, Wilbert Snellius, who eventually is what the uh, law was named after. Let's see if I can get that. Wilbert Snellius. He's credited, this is actually the time of his death, 1620, oops, 1626. But sometime in his lifespan, he found an equivalent version of Snell's Law. And histor history settled on naming the law after him. But let's dive back into the physics. What is the law? The law sa says that take a incident medium and an angle of incidence in one sine theta one. How much will that light refract? Well, it'll depend on what the new medium is, sine of the refracted angle. All right, absolutely crucial equation. You definitely should memorize this thing. You're gonna be using it over and over again in this class. The large chunk of our next material of optics, lenses, and mirrors are going to be based on exploiting this law here. So let's draw a picture to represent what's happening here. Here's our, our interface. And I'm going to have a ray come in. All the ray come in like so. Well, draw the normal. and measure this incident angle. So here's theta one, and I'm in some material in one. When I cross the threshold, I'm now in some material in two. And then we'll see the light refract as it changes mediums. So it'll go. It changes paths. So there's my theta two now. And this is the rule that we're gonna be exploiting over and over again. So some tricks, one that I find particularly useful all the time and I want you to remember. All right. Does the ray bend towards the normal or away? Same bounds. You could have rays. We'll draw some other examples. I could have a ray come in and refract towards a normal or let's see, ray comes in and it can refract away from the normal. Both are valid. So to remember which one's which, ha, which way is the light going to bend, you can always just apply Snell's Law and calculate it, but I like to do a shortcut. So remember, if N1 is greater than N2, then theta1 will be less than theta2. Alternatively, if N1's the smaller, if N1's less than N2, then theta1 will be greater than theta2. You want some words to go with it? Going from high to low bends away from normal.
Alternatively, going from low to high bends towards the normal. So let's start doing a little bit of practice with this. Let's do a relatively simple question, all right? The refracted ray will follow which path? And I'll draw it in a second. So let's make our little glass prism. change colors and let's send in our lights and we're gonna send our light like so so here's our normal line and now let's start looking at different refracted rays All right first one just follows along the normal line We'll call this option A. And I'll just keep going. I could have one that goes this way. Could have one that just extends. Could have a guy that just keeps going along. Or I have one that goes hitting the corner. Yeah, let's move this guy a little bit. A, B, C, D. All right. And we'll specify we're going from air to glass. All right. So which ray does it follow? Well, use our little shortcut. Don't need to use Snell's Law yet. All right. We could say, look, we're going from low medium, low to high, right? That means N1 is less than N2, bend towards normal. I.e. theta one is going to be greater than theta two. So with that, eliminate options C and D. Can't be those. You're left between A or B. And I'll tell you, the answer is going to be B. Why not A? Why can't it be A? I'll let you do that. You can just do a direct application of Snell's law, all right? It's very straightforward as long as you remember what sine of zero degrees is equal to. So, so yeah, use Snell's law to convince yourself that option A is impossible in this picture. Let's start building my one of my favorite concepts with this, right? And we're gonna do this through an uh, analogous example. We're gonna talk about a diver's refracted rays. All right. So what's gonna happen here? What's the setup? I'm gonna have a diver in a pool of water. So here's my water. Now I'll need a lot of it. So we've got air up here, water down here. And I'm gonna have a little scuba diver. A little scuba tank. Not making with Cyclops. And our scuba diver is going to be holding a laser pointer. So they've got some laser source here. Okay. 
And what they're trying to do is shine the rays, you know, up to their friends up high, right? So you've got a friend in a boat here, right? You're trying to shine the laser pointer at your friend in the boat, but because you're going from water air, that light bends. And so now the question is, well, what happens as I sweep angles of shining rays at my friends? So let's eliminate the boat for now and start doing some nice pictures. If, if my friends are directly above me, if they're directly above me, then I just shine my ray up like that. Well, what's the normal angle? The normal is boom, just a nice 90 degrees. And from Snell's law, you can immediately convince yourself that that refracted ray just keeps going up. All right, not too bad. So let's increase the angle a little bit. Let's do about 10 degrees. You shine your laser at your friends. They're off at some distance a little bit. You hit that normal line, and then you gotta refract. So we are going from high medium to low, which means bend away from the normal. So our ray is gonna do something like this. It bends away. Well, no problem. Friends can still see the razor, laser light being out. So let's keep increasing that angle. Keep increasing. Shine the laser over there. Always measure respect to normal. That's why I keep drawing it. So I've increased my incident angle, all right? So theta i keeps increasing. And therefore, the refracted ray is gonna start bending further and further away from the normal. Because remember, high to low means bend away from normal. So now I'm gonna start getting more extreme. Theta incidence, theta refracted. So, there's a limit. If I go too far, if I shoot a ray at too extreme an angle, what happens? The laser light leaves, hits the water, and it refracts so far away from the normal that it gets trapped. It skims the surface of the water. So there is some critical angle, some theta C. So we say that there exists a critical angle such that the refracted ray is at 90 degrees. All right. Now the way I phrase that, the ray is trapped in the water. So when does this happen, all right? Well, this is some critical angle. Here's a 90 degrees. So we can calculate just straight from Snell's law. So we're going from 
water to air in one sine of the critical angle is equal to N2 sine of 90 degrees. All right, sine of 90, well, that's just 1. So I've got N1 sine of that critical angle is equal to N2. Solve for that critical angle. That critical angle is going to be divide by N1. Take the inverse sine, the arc sine of N2 over N1. This is called our critical angle for total internal reflection. Why do we call it that? Why do we call it the angle for total internal reflection? Go back to scuba diver. All right. This ray here, right, as that ray propagates, it gets trapped in the water. The refracted ray doesn't escape. And what's not drawn here is the reflected ray. There's going to be a reflected ray there. And so the reflected ray is all that propagates forward because refracted is trapped. It can't escape the medium. So let's do a challenge problem with this. We always got to work in problems somehow. We can't just ramble on physics forever. So let's do a problem and use all these concepts that we're building up together. I'm going to make a prism, right? I'm going to have a triangular prism and ask, well, what incident angle will trap the light in the prism? So what is theta one such that ray is trapped? So let's draw a triangle. There we go. And I'll make life a little easy. I'm going to make this a 30 degree triangle. And what we're setting up here is a ray is going to come in at some unknown angle. All right. Ray comes in. Let's do that a little bit lower. Ray comes in at some unknown theta 1. We're going from, say, air to glass. And I'll say this glass has a refraction of 1.55. So I'm going from air to glass. We're going from low to high, then towards the, norm the normal. Let's make that a little bit more extreme. So there's some theta 2. And if this is the critical angle, then that refracted ray will just... Oop, one second. load and we're back All right so you'll then trap the ray if it hits at this critical angle so theta one this is the question what is this guy This is going to be a multi-step process. Right? We're going to start off by, I'll line up the steps to figure out what theta 1 is. Because, yes, you could do a Snell's Law. You could do a Snell's Law here. 
you do a Snell's laws here, but we don't have enough information. I don't know what theta one is, therefore I don't know what theta two is. So we're gonna have to work this problem backwards. First, we're gonna use Snell's law to get that critical angle, to get theta C for total internal reflection. Then we're gonna do geometry, guys. We're going to use geometry to figure out what theta 2 is. And then finally, we'll use Snell's Law again That's the process. That's, that's what we're going to be doing here. So let's work this out. Start step one. We are going from glass to air. So NG, sine of the critical angle, it's going into air. The refracted ray is at 90 degrees. That's the definition for total internal reflection. All right, so sine of 90 is one. We can divide by the index of glass, take the arc sine, so our critical angle is arc sine in air over in glass. Let's plug in some numbers. Arc sine of one for our purposes, one point, what I say the glass was? I said the glass was 1.55. And that gets us an angle of 40 point one eight degrees. All right. Circle that for now. We'll bring it back later. So critical analysis. If if this is forty point one eight degrees, you get total internal reflection. So that's step one. Let's try and do step two. Figure out what theta two is. So I'm going to redraw the triangle. I'm going to make it nice and big. I want as much space as possible. And let's make some very straight lines here. So I'm going to draw this backwards. Here's my normal line. There's my normal line. If from that line to here is about 40 degrees, which will translate to about in here. All right. There's 40 points. One eight degrees. And here's my theta two, the next guy we got to find. How do I figure out what theta two is? Well, from the geometry of the prism, we know that this is 30 degrees. So let's start using some geometric rules. I'm going to draw parallel lines right now. I'm going to draw a parallel line right here. And I'll use some colors to try and highlight this. All right. So for perspective, purple is that same parallel line. So we know that this angle here must be 30 degrees, which correspondingly means from purple to black is 30, purple to black, there's 30 degrees. Now here's the trick. Here's a little insight. I'm gonna use blue here. I'm gonna draw another triangle because all I wanna do is figure out what theta two is. So let's draw another triangle. Where the 
hypotenuse is the ray path. So here's the trick. Here's the trick. There's some unknown angle, I'll call it alpha. And we can just say, from the sum of angles of triangle, right? Theta 2 plus 90 degrees plus 90 degrees plus, oops. And it crashed again. One second. So theta 2 plus 90 degrees plus 30 degrees plus this unknown alpha guy. Well, that better equal 180 degrees. That comes from just summing up a triangle. All right. Next one. What can we do from here? Well, let's look at this alpha guy. Alpha from here to here in orange, well, oh my word, about that. No, no, no. full screen. Alpha, look at the orange right angle we just made. So now we can just say, hey, theta C plus alpha better equal 90 degrees, otherwise we're breaking geometry. Well, we've done geometry, now we're left with algebra. We've got two equations, two unknowns, alpha, theta two. We know what theta C is. So we can directly take this equation and say, look, this alpha thing, it's 90 minus theta c. If you must remember, it's 90 degrees minus that 40.18 degrees. Don't really care about alpha. I don't want to waste my time calculating that number. But just plug this value into theta 2. All right. So theta 2, 90 plus 30, that's 120 degrees plus alpha equals 180 degrees, All right? Plus 120 plus 90 minus theta C equals 180 degrees, All right? 120 plus 90, let's see if I'm doing this right. plus 30, that's 120. Subtract that across. I'm left with, let's see here, 120 plus 90, that is 210 degrees minus theta C equals 180 degrees. Well, theta 2 is equal to plus theta C plus 180 minus 210. Or this theta 2 guy, intermediate step, is that critical angle minus 30 degrees. If you must know, it's about it's 10.18 degrees. Let's go back to our drawing. Yeah, theta 2 is about 10 degrees. And that matches up with what we were expecting. Both our geometry and our mathematics agree. So, finally, finally, let's figure out what that incident angle has to be. I'm not going to draw a full triangle, so all we need to know is it comes in, it refracts out, 
theta 2, that's about 10 degrees. Here's that theta 1 in air, in glass. So just directly apply Snell's law in air. Sine theta theta 1 is equal to, in glass, sine theta 2. Or theta 1 is equal to the arc sine of in glass over in air sine of theta 2. Plug in the numbers. Arc sine. 1 point. 5, 5 over 1 sine of plug in the full number that 10.18 degrees right 10.18 degrees and we'll get that theta 1 if it is 15.9 degrees the ray becomes trapped in the prism Let's do some more things with uh, with our index of refractions. Let's step away from Snell's law for a little bit, and let's remind ourselves, right? Remember that light travels slower in medium. So index of refraction is C over velocity in medium. And the velocity of a wave is just the frequency times the wavelength. Or sorry, wavelength times the frequency. So if the velocity changes, does wavelength or frequency change? A little picture of this for ourselves. Let's send in a sinusoidal wave. We've got some wave coming in like so. And then it'll enter the medium. And something has to change about it. But imagine for those of you who are wearing glasses, do your glasses change the color light that you see? You know, go walk around outside at some time eventually, and you'll see through the glasses, through the windows, the light doesn't change colors when it passes through the window. So, when this ray or this uh this wave uh, passes through whatever it's getting uh, through this glass, it returns back to its original wavelength and frequency. So we can say outside the material, the speed of light is equal to some initial wavelength and initial frequency. Then in medium, it becomes lambda 1, F1. And then outside, it returns to lambda naught, F naught. Well, if a wave enters and exits, looking the same, then there's no energy loss. Passing through the medium. So we can just say, hey, energy before it enters the glass has to equal the energy while it's in the material. All right? Energy conservation. So what's the energy of a wave? Well, I'll just tell you. The energy of a photon is Planck's constant times the frequency. Right. Planck's constants. Right. 
is going to be six points. Those Stranger Things fans out there are probably shouting the number back at me right now. Six points, 626 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds is its units. All right. We won't focus too much on Planck's constant. It's actually not going to be relevant to our calculations. Because here we go. Let's plug things in. All right. If E0 is equal to E1, plug in the frequencies. All right. Planck's constant. The frequency before it enters the glass is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency while it's in the glass. Well, Planck's constant goes away. And the frequency in medium, outside of medium, is the same thing. So, the frequency is constant. Which means that the wavelength must change in medium. How much it changes? Straightforward, right? N is equal to C over V. C, well that's lambda naught, F naught. Velocity in medium is going to be lambda 1, F1. Lambda naught, F naught, F1 is just F naught again. So they cancel out, which means that N is equal to lambda naught, lambda 1. We can say that the wavelength in medium is the outside the vacuum wavelength over the index of refraction. All right. One more concept for you guys. One more, and then we'll call it a day here. We can talk about dispersion. So, a subtle thing. I know we just talked about this index refraction, but I have to introduce one little complexity here to it. It turns out that the index refraction is wavelength dependent. The index refraction for, a, say, a blue ray versus a red wave isn't exactly the same thing. Which correspondingly means, hey, if N is, for our, our purposes now, I'm going to say color dependence. Well, if the index refraction is color dependent, then by Snell's law, so is the refracted angles. So, we'll draw our prism. Here's a set. Oops. Oh, come on, undo that. There we go. So here's my prism. And what I'm going to do is send in some white light. We'll send in our white light. There's our normal. And because of different index refractions, red will bend some amount. Red will do this. And then with respect to its normal, refract this way. And the, the violets, the purples, well, they'll bend a bit more. They'll bend closer to the normal. And now we've created this dispersion of colors.
because the index is color dependent. It's not going to be the same refractive angle for all of them. And thus our end results. is a separation of the colors. All right. So a question for you. Is the index for red greater or less than, let's get our blues in here. So our blue is gonna do something like this. Is in red greater than or less than the index for blue? All right. So here's the way to look at this. All right. Consider the first refractory prism. All right. That's this angle here. All right, consider that. We're going from air to glass. In air is less than in glass. So the incident angle has to be greater than the refracted angle. I, we bend towards the normal. All right. So... Look at how much red bends towards the normal versus how much blue bends towards the normal. So we can just do simple analysis, all right? The color that bends more has the larger index. And therefore, we conclude that the index refraction of blue has to be greater than the index refraction for red. All right. So with that, let's make a rainbow. All right. So remember what I said, all right? Water. For water, I claim that the index is 1.333, all right? Well, if we're a bit more specific, the red index refraction in water is actually like 1.331, and the blue is 1.333. Three, four, three. Slightly different. Slightly different. And now let's make our raindrop. Yeah. Nice and big. Let's make it an actual circle. And I'm gonna draw a grid line for the center of this circle to help me with these drawings. Let's make that a little bit thinner. Yeah. So the center of the circle is about there. So here's my raindrop. And now let's start shining in rays of light at it. So here's a ray, here's a ray. Boom, boom. Coming in nice and parallel because the sun's super far away. And I'm going to consider this ray's path 
I'm going to consider the path of this ray when it hits the light. So this ray is going to come in and do something like this. Here's the normal. And I'm going to draw just the red ray. What happens? The red ray will refract. Hit that side of the water droplet. And yes, some of the ray reflects. So there's some reflection. We'll call this angle, this incident angle, I. We'll call this refracted ray, R. Right. So trace what happens. We get ray coming in and red refracts. Yes, blue, all the colors are refracting. We're only drawing red. So this red comes in, and then it hits this boundary. All right, well, there's another game of refracted and reflected. So that refracted ray, let's get this back up. Let's move up a little, bear this away. So some of that refracted ray just passes through like that. and some of it is still reflected. So, do some geometry, you can convince yourself that this angle is R again, and this angle is R as well. It has to be, it's a, ref it's a reflected ray. And then finally, the light will refract again. So here's our last normal angle, and it refracted out, bending away from the normal. We can do a bunch of work. I'm just gonna gloss over it here. I just want to show you an interesting concept, but we can actually convince ourselves that this angle here is I again. Also, it can be shown, it's not straightforward. All right, so white light. The combination of colors comes in, and then the colors split up. Bam, 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 out. Right? So, do similar analysis for a ray, not from the top, not from the top, but do similar analysis for a ray coming in. And it'll do something like, oh, let's see here. It'll do something like this. Uh, something out like that. So some analysis for ray at the bottom. So here's my Here's my droplet again. What happens? White light comes in and then they get refracted out. Red refracts out like so. again. It's going to ref red's going to reflect like that. And the same thing in this direction. So 
So there's this cone. Dang it. Cone of red light created. Well, do the same thing for blue. Blue is going to do the exact same thing. It won't reflect as, refract as much. But there is, in principle, the same thing happening here. So, blue. We'll do this. We'll have a cone of blue light. So, you look at the raindrop, you see these rays being bounced through the raindrop and coming back at you. Well, if you look here, if you look there, what do you see? You see white light. Inside that cone, if you're looking at the center, you're seeing red. Because remember, red's filling all of this space too. So you're seeing red, green, blue. You're seeing all the colors of the rainbow stacked on top of each other. And your eyes just interpret that as white light. But if you look just here, if you look there, you just see red. So looking on, looking at dead on, basically what you're seeing is white light surrounded by a cone of blue, green, yellow, broidy, bib, yes. Green, orange. All right. So you see the colors of the rainbow projecting outwards like that. So you sweep across to get the rainbow. Now I won't do this, not today, but I will say if we do a detailed analysis, we are skimming, glossing over this. We could do an entire lecture on just alone, this alone. But if you do detailed analysis, you'll actually see that rainbows always come in pairs. There's always a double rainbow. All right. So that, we'll call it into this lecture here. See you all next time.